Previously on Ethan Sees All. In a town like wherever, one is never quite removed from nature. And nowhere is she more talkative than within the embrace of the miles and miles of crowded woodland surrounding the secluded town. The camping group would have been an even foursome had I tagged along. I left Papa Zito, a local merchant of the antique, Domino, and the landlord, my... Uh landlord to go the journey as a trio. Beatrice and I watch in fascination as the trio limps past with heads hung low like prisoners of war. What happened? Trouble with the tent? Fret not for the vagabond. Tide moors all rest of ships thereon. Come again? I catch sight of Beatrice leaving Domino's room. Her face somewhat distraught the landlord didn't mention what, well, happened? Mom, she says. By the time I make it home again, Domino's nowhere to be seen. There, in the common hallway, crouches a figure, bent over and resting on knuckles and toe tips. I think I hear a low, chesty growling. You interrupted Din Din, Domino says, scowling. Domino, I am not letting you eat Pomplamoose. Tell him to keep that thing on a leash, or tonight, I'll be dining on Gecko Goulash. There comes a heavy, smashing sound, followed by a terrible, feverish scratching, a startled shout, a bang, and then a yelp, all in rapid succession. Slowly, I ease the door open to see my visibly shaken landlord. What's the hubbub, bub? I venture, unprepared for the answer. In tones of a whisper, he confides. It, it's Domino. The scene presented to me on reaching the third floor of the apartment complex, the landlord following closely at my heels, would be described by a forensic analyst as wicked gnarly. Wooden shrapnel flung about the hall from end to end transforms the carpeting into a splintery minefield and the warlike resemblances do not end there. Rather, when droplets of a deep red ooze lead my eyes down the corridor, where the droplets flow into a river amongst a growing number of the sharp, jagged edges which rise from the murk-like pilings, combat of a fatal nature seems the only reasonable cause None of the landlord's fevered warnings during the ascent could have prepared me for what, or who, lies, bloody and immobile, next to the remains of a bedroom door. Half off its hinges and gouged with overlapping, grain-exposing slashes, it's plain to see how the hallway came to its manic state. But in the answering of this question, yet more arise. My eyes come to rest on the bloodied mass, and my temperature sinks. You said he attacked just now? I ask. Came clawing at the door like a madman, screaming about how tasty Pomplamoose would be as jerky, says the landlord. Scared us both half to death, but I gave Pompey a chew toy to calm his nerves. Last night's tete-a-tete -tete rushes back with stunning clarity as I examine the glistening indentation stamped into Domino's crown. How'd you stop him? I wonder aloud. The landlord disappears into his room for a moment stepping strategically over and around the violent display. He returns bearing an oar, snapped just below the throat and still wet. 
Back in college, I was founder and captain of the rowing team, he explains. I forgot the lakes freeze year-round though, so no competing. On the plus side, we went undefeated. So this is the first time you've actually used it. Indeedy! For no practice, I bashed him one good, eh? The exclamation's veneer of pride does not escape recognition. But I knew he'd be alright. Look! With the measured movements of a bomb diffuser, he moves aside a skein of hair from Domino's still damp scalp. And nothing. No laceration, no bruising, not even a nick. As I marvel, the landlord rises and says, This isn't the first time. It's like that day after the camping trip. How do you mean? I went in to change his bandages, but he'd removed them already himself. And his arm. His arm? It was fine. I mean, that's, that's good, right? Not just fine. Fine, fine. Almost like... Like it was never there, fine. We look wordlessly from one another to the dark puddle widening across the carpet, born from no discernible source. And I just had that cleaned, sighs the landlord. Fissured pavement baked by an implacable sun, reacts with pockets of air just evading reach, and in that constant flux of temperature, refracts world-blurring waves that turn the midday wherever streets into streams of slithering, shimmering snakes. Remind me again why we're bringing him. I nod to an unconscious domino who, with his arms slung over our shoulders, looks like a nightly victim of the snake boot. A convenient cover story should anyone get a bit too curious. And leave him within eating distance of Pomplamoose? I don't think so. As he says this, he adjusts his grip on Domino's waist, paying little heed to the feet dragging along the damp ground behind us. Alas, our alibis go unused. And except for a series of signs leading up to the forest which absolve the town of all liability in the event of any spiritual possessions, we're met without opposition. In this way, we greet the forest's threshold, the singular entrance amidst an arboreal fortress that expands without foreseeable end in either direction. There is but one route forward. For a while, we follow the broken cobbled remnants of the incomplete hiker's path, the old rocks slick beneath a blanket of rotting leaves. After nearly a mile of trudging and hauling the dead weight between us, the gently curving trail starts to thin out, the ground becoming an increasingly unstable mix of cracked jutting stone and soft forest floor. There is a fair amount of sliding and the occasional stumble, the conclusion of which would send all three of us face first into sure concussions, but somehow we remain upright. Soon, we're faced with an ostensible dead end, where the grove of trees lining the path converges into a point. Noting my confusion, the landlord fumbles at his side and retrieves from his belt loop a short, serrated blade. Knowingly, he smiles. The campsite is just ahead. At this, he begins hacking and cleaving away at the indomitable brush of wild undergrowth spanning before us. It's no simple task throwing your weight into the heft of the swing, with hangers on subtly veering you off balance, like Remora suckling to a manta's underbelly. But, the landlord manages. 
Once the unruly jumble of understory is reduced to forest floor salad, he doubles over and grasps his knees upon the newly revealed dirt path, breathing heavily and wiping his brow. Before long, we're back on the move and meandering down the zigging and zagging route. By chance, I cast a glance backwards and watch in wonder as the underbrush we've just mowed to pieces appears to defy the sands of time, sending dozens of spiraling verdant shoots into the air, adorned with fat leaves and dewy buds. In seconds, it's as though we never passed through. Just as the landlord attested, but a short walk separates us and the grassy clearing that the most adventurous of visitors call the campgrounds. It is surrounded by a sweeping sentinel of sky-grazing elms. Every couple of yards, we maneuver around a discarded soda can or the burned-out pit of a former campfire. Despite chilling repute, the warm firefly buzz and hints of charcoal on the breeze make for an idyllic view. Carefully, like cradling a fractured egg, we lower our burden into the lushest patch of grass we can find. As for most of the trip thus far, Domino remains entirely inert. Except, that is, for the infrequent guitar sting he drunkenly mumbles. But I'm pretty sure he just does that in his sleep. <sighs> well, we made it, I say, dusting off my pant legs. Now what? Striking a match against his boot and tossing it into a stack of logs only lightly charred, the landlord crosses his legs before the growing blaze. Now we wait. So wait we do. Minutes trickle by into hours as an orange pink breaks over the canopies and the fire, which crackled in fierce bursts not long ago, has smoldered into a meek whisper of a flame. Only when it fizzles into nothing do we hear the sound. Far off, in the thicket of trees behind us, a twig snaps. There is a sharp rustling, at first seeming to originate from one corner of the impassable wood, and then another. We twist our necks this way and that accordingly, never quite getting a lock on the disturbance. All of a sudden, like a flipped switch, the commotion ceases. The landlord draws from his belt the jagged knife, and after hopping to his feet with much more zip than I would have thought him capable, stalks with the stealth of a jungle cat to the forest's edge. There's no sign of the landlord's typically labored breathing, which means he's holding in his as tightly as I am mine. Nearer he sneaks, the blade an extension of his outstretched arm. In one instant, my eyes are following his every movement, and in the next, watching closely the wall of trees he approaches. So, only a moment after it startles him do I see the creature emerge from the wood. That second of a head start, however, provides him no less confusion than I'm struck with. Confusion and relief, I should say. Sitting upon a low hanging bough, its tail swishing carelessly, a squirrel with fur of a rich caramel cranes its head as it tries making sense of the big man with the sharp stick staring down at it. Quickly, the landlord sheathes the blade. Oh, it was just this cute little guy, he says, cheeks burning scarlet. Who you calling cute, buddy? Asks a high-pitched voice. Please tell me the squirrel didn't just say that, begs the landlord, eyes shut to hard lines. Okay, it wasn't the squirrel, I assure him. He wheezes his relief. It 
was the rabbit, I say, pointing down toward the tawny bundle of fluff planted at his boot. When the landlord finally regains consciousness, we decide to give this um, interspecies powwow another go. I apologize, sincerely. It's just... Pomplamus never talks, he explains between gracious bows. The squirrel laughs in a way that calls to mind the twinkling of far-off bells and says... Huh, I get that a lot. I'm sure you won't be the last talking animal I meet this week, I say, holding out a hand. I'm Ethan. Do you guys bother with naming, or is that a strictly homo sapien thing? The guys call me Skip! Announces the bunny excitedly, wrinkling his pink nose. Then, practically on cue, the forest parts around us. And out steps a host of animals, petite and puerile each one. Fawns, fox kits, chicks new to wing, and chipmunks with even chubbier cheeks than is typical, like an assemblage from Baby's first storybook. They all stand, statuesque, at the sight's outer reaches. So what brings you fellas to wherever wood? Asks Skip. It can be pretty dangerous for squishy two-leggers like yourselves. The landlord, forgivably stupefied, stares agape at the amassing wildlife. In his stead, I speak up. My speechless landlord would corroborate that. So might Sleeping Beauty over there if he wasn't out cold. He's actually the reason we're here. See, he came home with this... Bite. Over there, Skip intones curiously, his head and ears flopped over at an angle. Over where? Why, in that grassy knoll, I begin, but when I gaze absently in the direction of our charge, terror grips my nerves in a stranglehold. Where we'd laid Domino down just a few hours ago, there was now a domino-shaped indent. You'd think my and the landlord's necks were on a swivel by the way they rotate to search the whole of the campsite. No luck. No domino. Worry starts to set in, as does the scorching sun overhead. Wait. The sun set almost ten minutes ago. Then, what's with this shadow slowly expanding around us? I look up, and, as if time has crept into slow motion, watch the amorphous visage solidify into a pouncing beast, barreling down at our group with the scornful fury of an atom bomb. I open my mouth, maybe to call out a warning, or maybe to scream, but the air is forced from my lungs by a sideways tackle that sends me sprawling to the ground. Then, a dull thwack. When the landlord rolls off of me and I've regained some control of my breathing, I hack out a thanks and turn to the spot several feet away where I'd just been very nearly mauled by an angry flying shadow. There, face down against a protuberant rock, lies Domino, all ferociousness sapped. Aside from the thin finger of blood trickling down his forehead, he somehow looks peaceful. Tracking the path of his fall upward, I notice an overhang of thick branches, each bent slightly askew. How'd we miss him scaling a tree? The landlord inquires, following my line of sight. Looks like he's worse off than we thought, I muse. Skip, having taken refuge behind a mighty tree bowl at the first looming of danger, bounces back into the open 
staring quizzically at Domino as he hops past. Golly gee! You sure weren't kidding about your friend there! He laughs. I drop to one knee, and a look of resigned humility settling across my brow, plead. Look, if there's any way of helping him... I know just the thing! Skip says brightly. He gestures me closer, beckoning me to his eye line with a curling of his snowy paw. I oblige, hunch deeper, listen attentively. What I hear is not the comforting squeak of Skip's improbable voice, but a laborious swish, like rusted metal scraping along its worn casing. In an attempt to glance downward, something sharp jabs me beneath the chin. I know just the thing for all of you, he finishes, twirling the blade casually into supple flesh. The scuffle of the landlord's boots over turf as he starts my way is all too quickly drowned out by the drumming of hooves come to life. All around us, a furious chittering and whinnying and braying of a not-so-statuesque legion conspires into cacophony. I'd cover my ears if I weren't so sure any sudden movement could result in having a multi-tool lodged somewhere both medical and carpentry professionals would disapprove greatly of. Brandishing a moderate armory of switchblades and brass knuckles between them, and grimacing in a manner I didn't think possible for furry snouts. The adorable forest critters heard us around the largest of the fire pits. I still don't know where they found logs large enough or the surfeit of twine necessary for such a feat. But, with surprising speed, the landlord and I are hogtied, though I know well enough how the hog tying happened, blasted raccoon hands, and mounted as a huntsman mounts trophies before an audience of spectators, cuddly and thirsty for blood. In the commotion, I lose sight of Domino, who, as far as I can tell, is carted off by the larger, though still quite young, members of the pack. With no leverage to speak of, I demand, What are you doing with Domino? In taunting, Skip replies, well, I'd be more worried about what we're going to do with you. Never once relenting in cheer, Skip hops to the landlord and, with a few moments of determined sawing, cuts down the latter's fanny pack. You'd think him a common scavenger from the way he rummages single-mindedly, rejecting the unwanted contents, shaving razors, leather straps, an absurd amount of black licorice, like detritus. Any ordinary vermin might lose interest as soon as the first high-preservative, low-nutrition snack cake comes tumbling out of the pouch. But not Skip. Skip's frantic search doesn't end until the object of desire is gripped firmly between his forepaws, and our faces must register genuine dismay because his smile only widens. He produces a stick from the matchbox and holds it aloft for us to see, a sinister game show presenter. Then, on his heel, he spins to face the ellipse of creatures, all waiting on bated breath. So, taking our home wasn't bad enough for you pant wearers, says Skip to a wave of hushed murmurs. You thought you'd sick your wolf on us. Can we just roll over and take it? Hoofbeats surge with an energy anxious and menacing. Wolf? I try asking, my voice lost to the frenzy. But are we gonna take it? The audience becomes a fearsome, dissenting roar. Above us, the last streaks of burnt orange are just vacating the sky. Show them what happens when they burn us! 
along the sole of the landlord's boot, one of which was confiscated in the rather indelicate gagging and binding, and is now being worn as a hat by a skunk. Skip brings down the match in a guillotine swipe, as sure as the resulting crackle of life is thunderous. Flame snakes up from the tip, and the forest, all but for the rabbit's luminous bulb, seems to blacken around us. Not a peep escapes the rapt observers, which is certainly noteworthy considering, as you'll remember, quite a few of the attendees possess wings. Skip turns from his brethren to look us squarely in the eyes, and there, somewhere deeper than vision, beyond the twisting reflection of matchlight, a terrible vehemence broils hot enough to sear the skin Yet his face, all sweet button nose and twitching whiskers, betrays no inner workings. Any last words? He hums, one ear folded over onto itself. Having gathered my thoughts in the preceding cattle roundup, and thus loaded with enough verbal ammunition to stock a bunker, I begin. As a matter of fact, yes. For starters... Help! Help! Help me! I don't want to die here! Why doesn't this country have Mounties? Is this really the high note of dignity you want to go out on? Asks an unfazed Skip. Honestly, man, get it together, I say, with a touch less sympathy than intended. The landlord volleys loathsome glares between the bunny and I, amidst muffled sniffles, and then hangs his head to pout. I'd settle for a park ranger. As I was saying, I think you've got the wrong guys. Ha! Huh. You humans are all wrong. Skip scoffs. You tread where you aren't welcome, and you erect monuments to yourselves. And you destroy, and you destroy, and you destroy! Until you leave the inheritors of your obliterated wasteland with no options but retaliation! Recovering an inkling of his composure, the landlord snuffles. Oh, sure. Some of us could do with a refresher course in animal companionship, uh, but we aren't all bad. Why, one of my sisters runs alpaca conservations across the northern territories. Your parents must be so proud, I say. Huge family disappointment. Enough! Warns Skip, stomping impatiently. Our stake half conceals a heaving mound of outerwear, citrine jackets and moth-eaten cardigans, abandoned by campers in fevered rushes, and drenched nauseatingly in kerosene. The pervading odor invites lightheadedness. So much so, that I vocalize thoughts one with a greater sense of self-preservation might contain. For such a cute little guy, you've really got a temper, huh? Any conviviality evident within Skip's sneer wilts and shrinks away to reveal a new, blank darkness. I'm not cute! And with a flick, the match is sent pinwheeling. An eruption of heat, geysering like a deep sea thermal vent in the throes of a temper tantrum, mushrooms behind us, reducing the hairs on the backs of our necks to smoldering crisps. The campsite comes aglow. While invisible to us in scope, the terrible blaze burns in miniature within the eyes of each odd and transfixed animal. A sea of frozen forms, beset with tiny undulating torches. The landlord's incessant shuddering threatens to jostle us backward into the pyre before Bunny Boy ever gets the chance. Jack! A boost, if you would be so kind. Skip commands, to the start of a donkey foal who Having managed to doze off during the preceding excitement, shakes off the dust of slumber and hobbles through the parting crowd to the sacrificial altar 
with all the expedition of a pension worker on his final ship before retirement. Once in place, Skip springs onto the donkey's back and scrambles to make a perch atop its head, as if nearness sweetens the smell of our torment. White hot tongues of flame swirl in agonizing proximity, drawing out sheets of sweat and then boiling them to vapor in a vicious cycle not unlike the world's most unpleasant personal sauna. Making matters in no way more accommodating, the unlucky rabbit's foot arcs ever closer. Skip presses his paw experimentally against my chest and, in a shift of scorched polyester, glowing embers spark up and singe our necks. Our winces must bring amusement because he repeats the motion again and again as boredom sets in and his foot comes to a rest, Skip searches our faces intently. Nothing visible in his own eyes, but the all-consuming fires of derision. Sated by the spoils of his torturous campaign, he nods sagely. And then, winding back a powerful hind paw, Skip gloats loud enough for all the onlookers to hear. See you in heck! When I don't feel the foot connect, after a grueling second and a half that drags out like an eternity, my being receives a one-two punch of appreciation for not being a roasted marshmallow, and a perhaps inopportune curiosity for the susurration of leaves, drawing the attention of everyone in listening vicinity. The landlord's eyes are sealed tighter than steel traps, and even I must admit that I've poured my energy into bracing myself for being burned alive, so we're at a collective disadvantage for information gathering. Skip's powder pink pads hang in mid-air mere centimeters from our constraints. Guys, who's rustling? We did the rustling bit already, and we've moved on to homicide! We have dress rehearsals for a reason! He groans and slides down the donkey's neck. Eyeing the lot over, he appears to be doing mental arithmetic. Is anyone missing? Everyone's accounted for. So who's... As an answer, one astute pygmy tapir lets out a shout. Oh, sh It's the wolf of the wood! Scatter! Cries of abject horror envelop the animal folk, and Skip's happy-go-lucky declarations of safety persuade not a single paw or hoof to halt its stampede. An assortment of limbs flies every which way, as Philly trips over Hedgehog over Goat Kid. Chaos threatens to engulf the flock, until, as if of one mind, the gang of tiny woodland highwaymen disperses blindly into a hundred directions, disappearing behind the panoramic enclosure of sheltering forest. All, that is, except for one courageous little rabbit, Spluttering and pounding the dirt with rage, Skip seems to doubt the disintegration of his plans. But, upon a moment of contemplation, his face becomes a venomous grin. A hurried look our way, and then he, like his minions, goes on the retreat. I'll leave the wolf to finish you off! His maniacal snickering can be heard long after he has made the forest his cloak. That's him! cries the landlord. There's the mongrel what bit Domino! Like a moth trying desperately to kick an old habit, the wolf, or what can be seen of him, prowls along the perimeter of the firelight's ring. If I thought I was sweating before, 
The sight of the beast padding past, a moonlit silhouette whose obscurity in no way impacts the scale of its enormity, turns my back into a veritable waterfall. You thought that was a dog? I say. What? You've never seen the dogs up north? Being able to see the wolf swiftly unveils itself as the preferable alternative, when in the sudden, deliberate steps of someone for whom a light bulb has just gone off, the wolf moves beyond the limits of my constraint-stunted vision. What can't be seen, the imagination is frightfully skilled at constructing. It conjures up, in the warm clarity of delirium, a mouth of crocodilian proportions, white fangs seeming to hover in midnight black, unhinging slowly. The landlord chants in a subdued, wheedling voice what could either be a last prayer or his body releasing excess fear in a concentrated mist. For an instant, the very air around us hangs still. As in that stagnant millisecond following a nuclear detonation, right before meltdown, Sound and movement and time itself slow to a stop. Sweat travels the curve of my cheek. Then, with all the ferocity of a cyclone, a column of swirling gale force winds bears down on us, driving deeper into a severe angle of the stakes to which we've been trust. The gust's sheer might forces my eyes shut. Meekly, once the tempest begins to subside, they flutter open, blinking away flakes of ash and debris. No longer does the flaming tower bite at our backs. A smell not unlike molten tractor tire haunts the campsite as in eulogy for its fallen pyre. Strong arms reposition the poles vertically, and with the swing of a blade over a wet stone, our restraints fall lax about us. Phew! says the wolf, breathing onto his claws and burnishing them along his coat. That really took the wind out of me! Fatigue and an inkling of gratitude suppressed the groan worming its instinctive way from my throat, which is now, courtesy of smoke inhalation, inflamed to a throbbing red welt. The wolf, in far more amiable spirits than when the flames still roared, sets a net at our feet, such as a fur trapper might use. It isn't empty, however as the slight movements from within inform us. I believe this belongs to you, says the wolf, crouching down with one digit wielded like a bowie knife. He slices a wide gash into the net and out tumbles Domino, very much still asleep as several prods with a long stick go to prove. Found him roped to a tree guess they were gonna leave him for last. His kind is a rarity, one whose destruction they savor. His kind? I struggle. An in-betweener. Ah, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And how rude to skip introductions. I've collected many a name since the turning most of which have been lost to time. But nowadays, I'm known as the Wolf of the Wood. Wolf of the Wood! It's got a nice ring to it. Under the icy pallor cast upon tree, petal, and thorn by a fully risen moon, tufts of silvery gray can be made out, decorating the wolf's dense coat. The diffused yellow lacquer of senescence paints in his eyes, a wisdom and knowing foreign to our earlier captors. 
Massaging the reddened grooves where ropes had not long ago bound my arms, I clear my parched throat and say, I'm Ethan. That's my landlord. The landlord takes this moment to dry heave behind a tree. And the comatose fellow on the ground, He'd be Domino, concludes the wolf. Lucky guess? Not quite. Once you've been around as long as I have, it becomes prudent to keep eyes and ears everywhere. Sometimes you attract enemies. At this, he glances sidelong at our trio. I gulp. And sometimes new friends, he says, before heartily guffawing. Mr. Wolf, I say as the laughter dies down. Don't be so formal, man. Call me Wolfie. Mr. Wolf, if you know Domino's name, might it be a stretch to assume you also know why we're here? It wouldn't be, he says. But I didn't need informants to know that, seeing as it's Partially my responsibility. I knew it, cries the landlord, who returns promptly to smoke-induced retching. Okay, yes, fine. I bit the kid. You happy? I'll explain everything, but can we talk about this somewhere else? Away from prying eyes that aren't under my employ. I would also like to be far away from this pit of cinders but trusting too freely in talking forest animals has put us in enough figurative and literal binds today. All the same, I ask, what did you have in mind? I have this lovely little cave carved into the side of a hill, about a half hour's hike south of here, he explains. Oh, no. He wants to get us alone so that when he eats us, No one can hear the screams, the landlord protests. The wolf's expression darkens. You operate under the illusion that I couldn't eat you where you stand. We both gulp. At once, laughter sends the wolf into fits. Come, come. The night's getting on, and we really must hurry. And out of either terror or irrational faith, we follow. Having spent much of his time over the long years alone, or in the company of fellow quadrupeds, the wolf's travel estimates are wildly off. He's kind enough to stop and turn back each time he notices the distance his powerful legs have torn between us. That only makes for slower going. It is nearly an hour later before we're standing, breathless, in a small grove, girdled on three sides with tall, arching cypress trees, and on the fourth by a round, grass-covered knot of land. Draped about the cave's mouth hangs a curtain of vines, through which one can catch only glimpses of the hollow held within. We dare not approach. Please, make yourselves at home, says the wolf. Mi cueva es su cueva. If it's all the same to you, I think I'll stay out here in the open, where there are witnesses, says the landlord. Maybe later, I throw in. The wolf gives a shrug. Suit yourselves. He then slips into his cave, leaving us alone in the warm, shadowy glen. Awe settles firmly into irritation as the minutes draw on with no response from the wolf. Eventually, impatience overriding good sense, I gather the courage to move a foot closer and, in tones barely above a whisper, 
call out for our absent host. Yeah? He answers back, his voice an echo. Well, you were going to tell us how to fix our friend, right? Right, right, he says, and from the cave comes a clamor. And tell you I shall. Parting the vine curtains, out pours a crew of graying terrestrial predators lugging musical equipment. The wolf is last among them and brings up the rear with a tinner sack strapped to one shoulder. Just to be nice, let me instill some advice. The wolf begins melodically. Wait, I interrupt. Are you about to sing it to us? Isn't there some more time-efficient method? Like, say, talking, suggests the landlord. Oh, well, it's just that the band's all set up and everything. This is the only time Terry gets to leave the den. I hate my stepkids! Woo! Exclaims a ginger bobcat behind a drum kit. We're in a bit of a time crunch, please. The abridged version. He sighs. All right, everyone, pack it in. The middle-aged animals groan. A grumbling trip into his bachelor cavern later, and the wolf holds, between clawed thumb and forefinger, a yellowed parchment. As the landlord and I eye it over gluttonously, piecing together the meaning of its abstract scrawlings, the wolf says, somewhat less enthusiastically, What you hold in your <coughs> ungrateful mitts is a first and only edition wolf-approved map of wherever would. Every enchanted nook and haunted cranny charted to obsessive detail. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but... It's unlike any piece of cartography I've ever seen. Charted farther out into the sprawling forest than any man has ventured to go or lived to recall. I tell the wolf as much, and his laughter erupts anew. It helps, then, not to be a man, man, he says. It is to one of these scarcely disturbed locations that the wolf points a bladed finger. The well, he says, the woods well. It's a reservoir filled with curative waters that appear but once a month. Soak your friend in the magic of the well before sunrise and he should be healed of his wolfish affliction. And if we fail, I caution, I'd invest in titanium nail clippers. The wolf tells us more about the well, about the dangers that lie in the forest ahead, and about Domino's transformation, which, by his estimates, culminates in just a few hours' time. With your map here, we've still got a fighting shot. Thanks for everything. It's the least I can do. Haven't gotten you lot into this mess in the first place. Speaking of which, I gotta know. Just what happened between you two? Presently, the wolf melts into fond reminiscence before remembering he's entertaining company and reddening in the cheeks at least feigns contrition. Your friend possesses a musk with a chemical makeup indistinguishable from that of Wolf's Bane. The stuff's like catnip, one whiff and it's wolves gone wild. I've lost whole days on it myself, he explains. Great at parties. Well, he's right here. You're not gonna go all Cujo on us, are you? I ask. The Wolf of the Wood points up his snout and he gives a little twitch. Hmm. No, he just smells like a wolf now. That's probably not a good sign, huh? 
I wouldn't go waving it around any protests if that's what you're asking. He can intuit from our silence that it isn't. It means his window is closing. But safe passage to the well lies in your hands. Be forewarned, travelers. Great evils inhabit this wood. More evil than a knife-wielding furball? More evil than a knife-wielding furball. But to be fair, that cat is pretty creepy. I thought he was a bunny, whispers the landlord. We are once more in the thick of pursuit, chasing folkloric mumblings as one stranded in the desert chases a mirage. Like the most emotionally volatile neck pillow known to man, Domino's definitely probably not dead body winds up slumped over the landlord's more than capable shoulders as I navigate using the map proffered us by the wise wolf, drawn with even less adherence to artistic convention than the human-made charts seen collecting dust in roadside tourist trap windows, but with infinitely more accuracy. Detailing landmarks not by visual representation, but in a language founded on the senses. If west be where your bounty leads, track the spore of ambergris. Isn't that harvested from whales? Why would whales be in a forest? And at this time of year. <sighs> Do you want to hear about the excrement synthesizing goblins who run a counterfeit perfume scam from the deep woods? Or... Do you want to save Domino? Duty dictates I choose the latter, but I can't say I'll stop thinking about the goblins. Nor should you. Circumventing the goblin grove, tiptoeing with care so as not to wake the mother gob. Through the bramble of uncomfortable personal truths, where a traveler's adeptness for petulant denial and plugging their ears with their fingers is put to the test. And finally, along a faint trail, the slimy, glittering evidence of a school of juvenile pixies not long past. Even with our weak human noses, its pungency makes a fine marker in those places where the visible shimmer subsides. Eventually, scent fails us too, as the trail peters off once more into normal forest floor. We continue southward at a crawl, me consulting the map and scanning the distance for our next landmark. The landlord concluding that the most comfortable position for carrying an unconscious tenant is wrapped around the neck like a boa. Suddenly, in the same instant as a far-off twinkle draws my eye, there comes a tremor from below. Vexation over the apparent seismic activity stills us, and after indecision's shackles loosen, we both make for nearby tree trunks. Too late, however. As though the ground senses our desperation, it gives way. To have presumably been bore without the aid of opposable thumbs, it is remarkable the width and height achieved in the making of the whole whose occupancy has just grown threefold. Sitting amongst the pieces of a broken frame, its mesh camouflaged in twigs and leaves, the landlord and I try to silence even the chattering of thought, in the vain hope of negating such a paroxysm of sound and motion as falling into a hole produces, just the sort of thing you become acutely aware of when carrying around a sleeping murder hound. With a duo of inward sighs, we note his unconsciousness, and, in a bit of preemptive quarantining, claim one small semicircle, as far from the toothy end of him as possible. Now, I say, just where'd that map get to? The landlord spots it before I do, 
a square lying precipitously over the edge of the chasm, just out of sight and far out of reach. Fortuitously, a compassionate wind comes blowing to send it the full way over, and we give a silent, encouraging cheer. As the map hovers momentarily at the hole's entrance, ready to ride the downward draft, a sandy-tinted paw reaches over the mouth and snatches it clean from the air. One snicker, dripping with malice, and the culprit becomes all too clear. Ears first, confirming our darkest suspicions. Skip's head lurches into view. Did you miss me? The chipper voice squeaks. Can't say I did, no. No, not really. Skip tears the parchment a fraction. On second you thought, You look fantastic. Yes, every Have second. you been hitting the running wheel? Have I mentioned how cute your tail is? Skip's laughter grates like a storm drain. Appropriate, because in the coming seconds, when he splits the map into halves and then fourths, giving up in frustration during the eighths, a drain is precisely the receptacle down which any lingering optimism swirls. Oh yeah! He says, before darting away once again into the blue night. Oh. <laughs> what a stinker! I moan, listening to the unsettling cackles taper off. This proves only a momentary distraction, of course, because the nearby growls gaining in intensity by the second, rest away all attention, moving as if underwater. The landlord and I make a slow, circular sweep. Our faces drop. That Domino is approaching is no great surprise. Hair raising, yes, but to be expected. It's the changes overtaking him as he crosses that cause the blood to run cold. Bone crunches sickeningly as it realigns into shapes primitive yet robust. The ankles elongating and the spine curving and the proportions taking on a template neither man nor creature but of some ghoulish amalgam. Wiry hairs begin to sprout from the exposed bits of flesh, prickling up sporadically and then exploding in waves of dense black fur. Where once rested incredibly standard human sensory organs, there now protrudes a very canine muzzle. When the transformation is all said and done, Nothing of Domino remains but a tattered pair of denim shorts. Neither of us can recall if they were that way before. His jaw drops into a snarl, bearing rows of vicious daggers, all eager to rip. Saliva froths at the corners of a wide, hungry maw. In the moonlight, Casting a soft azure film over the forest, Domino's eyes glow in unearthly green. Phosphorescent moss floating atop a still lake surface. Eyes that peer at us, not with familiarity, but with puzzled consideration. To eat or not to eat. Wishing very much to keep my skeleton internal, sorry, Yorick, I nudge the landlord with a heel. Psst! Anything in that fanny pack of yours with woolly mammoth tranquilizing capabilities? Gaze never averting from the haunted pupils, the landlord searches by touch for anything of use. The smile that works across his face kindles in my mind's recesses a spark of hope. A triumphant reveal, the arm whisked away from the satchel, 
and the spark is doused in a wheelbarrow of sand. Clasped as if it were a live grenade, the object, red, fist-sized, and veiny, could almost pass for the real article, save for a glossy laminate coating. Is... is that a plastic steak? I don't believe the words as I'm asking them. It was supposed to be a real one, the landlord says, arm still extended. You know, in case we got hungry. I guess in the rush I grabbed Pomplamoose's favorite toy. Great, we're going to die, but at least Pimoose will be dining in elegance. Evidently, having made up his mind or grown bored of our piteous attempts at survival, Domino's growling takes on chainsaw brutality. The intent to maim comes through clear in each lip tremble. The teeth are not so much teeth as a restless bear trap laid in a void hollow. We are not alerted to his approach by the sound of footfalls, inaudible as they are but by how much louder in the cavity of our heads his hunger echoes. The bright green orbs float closer. Drool wets the bear trap. Cool dampness and moist heat mix as nose and great bladed rictus come to dreary proximity. Someone gulps. I'm not certain who, but as a summation of our situation, it's rather succinct. I think it's the last sound I'll ever hear. Funny. The underworld sounds much more like a squeaky toy than I might have guessed from brochures. And the playful panting that follows could very well belong to Cerberus, ready to put three sets of chompers to good use on fresh human playthings. The unmistakable sensation of not being bitten into, however, bids me ease my eyes open. Where only moments prior did the miasma of an insatiable bloodlust seem to permeate our confines, there now exists no trace of the dark mood. Domino, the blaze behind his emerald eyes diminished, has lost all interest in us, and instead appears utterly transfixed by the landlord's hand. Rather, what's contained within. Hey! I signal with utmost discretion. Squeeze the meat again! Huh? Says the landlord clearly surprised to still be alive as well. But understanding comes shortly, and he flattens the toy in his fist. Domino, three to four times more gargantuan than an obese Newfoundland, and with ten times the bite force, ducks down and splays his forelimbs in universal dog code for, you gonna chuck it or what? So, the landlord chucks it. With a chirp, it lands on the other side of the hole, where Domino chases it in bouncy juvenile bounds. Phew! And the renunciation of a few demon pacts forged in haste is our collective response. For a while, it and determined squeaks alone fill the stifling quiet. As enthused as I am not to be mincemeat, I say, once enough time has passed to safely discount the inevitability of demise, our dilemma is minimally less dire, at best. Nodding his agreement, he and I size up once more the dimensions of our underground cell and find it once more to be unscalable. Even standing on the landlord's shoulders, Several feet remain between my fingertips and sweet freedom. 
We're floating around the idea of fashioning the broken framing into stilts when it begins. Sounding out in waves over the night come wailing howls, initially only in small numbers, though a chorus soon finds its footing. The forest rings alive with the haunting song of wolves. Pricking up his ears, Domino drops the squeaky toy, which whines as it reinflates. Soft whimpers begin to escape this quivering snout. He paces about restively, yipping now and again, but once the howling overhead reaches its sonic peak, Domino can't restrain the bestial instinct coursing throughout him, and, in a tempest of noise rivaling that of the combined pack, he ruptures our eardrums with a blood-curdling squall. <coughs> Holding your ear to the rotor of a roaring jet engine would seem a kitten's purr in comparison. What will it take to shut you up? I plead. Like a valve twisted shut, the cacophony, in our close quarters anyway, takes an abrupt pause, while outside, wolf music plays on. Scratch me behind the ears, says Domino, lacking a hint of irony or shame. Not gonna happen, I say, quite resolutely so astounded by the very notion that I forget to be astounded by Domino's sudden ability to speak. The yowling kicks back up again, although this time with the effect of fading in and out like the horn of a 2 a.m. freight train. If, if I scratch you behind the ears, will you stop being a massive baby? I'll consider it. That felt like a personal low point. Don't act like you didn't love it, says Domino, his tail a wagging blur. That bit of embarrassment behind us, our thoughts return to the urgent matter of freeing ourselves from imprisonment. The landlord and I brainstorm, in vain, and when no avenues present themselves, Domino interjects with an idea all his own. We object profusely at first, but in lieu of alternatives and with night drawing steadily on, the decision is made for us. Seeking to test his nascent strength of both will and might, Domino launches us, one at a time like hay bales, over the ditch's edge. He makes the leap himself with little effort. No one bears any more of a likeness to a scrambled egg than when our quest began, so we consider it a success. From the gaping rim, we can just make out a dim glow beaconing through a darkened wood, seemingly not far off. Gradually, we take off into a sprint, Domino's muscular canine legs pumping him to the head of the trio with ease. Powerful thrusts forward, kick up a slurry of wet leaves and toadstools. One drawback to his speedy four-legged trot, however, is the inability to slow or stop on a dime. A skill that might have proven helpful had he known what lies ahead. Instead, from our distant positions, the landlord and I see only a rapidly shrinking wherever wolf, and the twin peaks of pointed ears as they zoom out of sight. A wailing Arr! trails off into nothingness. Unsure of what to expect, we trade bemused looks and, with a fair bit of caution, jog up a ways to what we quickly discover is a sharp downward incline, made invisible from afar by a copse of trees. Wrapping one arm around a trunk, 
I peer out over the precipitous drop. It's tough to make out in the failing light. But I think I see the sheen from a dark coat of fur midway down the slope. Cupping my mouth with my free hand, I call out, Domino! Are you all right? He's supporting himself by a gnarled limb of a root, jutting out from the unlevel ground. From the way he and the root are bobbing, I don't expect it to support him for long. I've been better, he jokes diffidently, a swaying in his voice to match the swaying in his body. We're getting you out of there, I assure him. I then turn to the landlord and half whisper, How exactly are we getting him out of there? I heard that, cries Domino. Darn those wolf ears, I mutter under my breath. It's not much, says the landlord, as he rifles through his fanny pack, tossing aside a compass, a bread roll, which is promptly snatched up by a team of enterprising ants, carabiners, a human-to-giant dictionary, and a water filtration system, not the portable sort, stopping only when he's happened upon a length of rope. No ordinary rope, mind you. This cord is jet black and grooved with spirals. But it's better than nothing, he finishes. My face sags as the realization takes hold. Licorice? I moan. Licorice? Domino yelps. Licorice? Says the landlord. He takes a bite of one end. Hey! I seize the rope from him before he can sneak a second. Oh. With some minor alterations out of the way, including plating the rope to sufficient thickness for minimized death plummets, I knot one end of the line around the landlord's waist, leaving just enough to lower myself to Domino's position. All the while, the distant light we glimpsed from the hole grows fainter. A deep breath, a quiet prayer to the forest spirits, and I begin down. Immediately, the slippery leaf litter bunching at my feet complicates an already unyielding landscape, but a steel grip on the rope and the occasional tree trunk offering stability keep me right ways up. You know, relatively. An integral lesson, I quickly learn, is allowing yourself to slide ever so when the ground would have you. Trying to resist ends only with a sore backside, or worse. I inch, step by step, glide briefly over pockets of mushy turf. Inch, glide, always looking back and forth from my licorice line to Domino, who, to distract himself from the earth slowly crumbling around his root, is humming a jaunty tune interlaced with hushed whines. His eyes must be closed, because he asks, with tremulous voice, You getting close there, pal? I don't blame him. His recently acquired night vision comes with distinct weaknesses. In this deathly dark, beneath a shield of treetops, I've only the specters of my imagination to contend with, while, for Domino, the specifics of our probable fate read as clearly as sky riding on a cloudless day. Not a very popular sky riding outfit, I'd wager, if their messages only spell certain doom. Just hang in there, I say, ejecting all thoughts of motivational kitten posters from mind and attempting to meter my winded breathing. It's only a little further now, which is but small respite in this game of strategic movement. Around a gangly sapling I swing myself, loosening the skin of tender young bark beneath my grasp. 
Domino, his whimpering now having fully supplanted the melody of his diversion, hangs less than a yard off. The gap closes further each second. It seems that with every movement I make, Domino's lifeline shifts more and more from its earthen grip. Then, as a musk invades my sinuses, invoking something between pure animalism and month-old chow mein, I know I've struck gold. Hurdling a mossy boulder embedded in the hillside, I shimmy at last into arm's reach of a noticeably shivering wherever wolf. Monstrous, yet helplessly minuscule. Heels digging into turf, lasso rounding my palm, I call out Domino's name. After a moment, his ears pull back, uncovering two watery pools, shimmery with hyperbolic gratitude. You came back for me! He exclaims, utilizing his prehensile ears as windshield wipers and clearing away the welling tears. You thought we wouldn't. This dog brain has attachment issues. Don't blame that on the dog brain, I say. Steadily, beneath even the restrictive dome of foliage, I can see gloom conquering more and more of the outer world. Were time an engine, we'd be running on fumes. I offer him my unoccupied hand, and a smile meant to convey confidence, and not the more furtive paranoia with which I am currently well acquainted. For a split second, he appears to be returning the gesture, wolfish lips curling at their edges into a coquettish grin. But the ever-collapsing safeguard between his paws snaps us back into focus. Emancipating itself centimeter by centimeter from its gravelly encasing and working loose a small landslide of sediment that tumbles in clouds to the abyss below. Domino's root, now fully exposed in all its waifish decaying glory, seems to whine beneath his weight. Fibers that haven't seen rainfall in years groan and pop like violin strings. The look that eclipses Domino's face transcends the animal kingdom. Sheer terror. In that instant of fear, his fight-or-flight response activates because with a sequence of motion nearly too fast to follow, one massive paw relieves itself of the root, the blackened husk tearing away and disappearing below, while the other shoots up and throttles my wrist in a circulation-dampening bind. Here, the slope tilts merely a few degrees from the vertical, so that keeping any semblance of footing takes every bit of attention, every ounce of concentration. Unfortunately, I neglect to factor in the additional strain that a freshly transformed beast of the moon might have on otherwise feasible candy climbing gear. It is just this mathematical equation over which I am exerting sizable brain power when the licorice rope begins to thread. Domino, doing everything in his power to look anywhere but down, tilts his head backward and instead trains his gaze toward the canopies. Dude, he says, if we don't make it, I just want to say, thanks for coming to my rescue. Oh, of course. I mean, you'd do the same if it were me undergoing metamorphosis. I so would, cause we're bros. I caution a smile. And as your bro, I feel now's as good a time as any to tell you that it wasn't an abnormally large possum you saw rifling through the dumpster last week. That would explain the abnormally large smell. We indulge in a bit of stifled laughter. Any levity is shortly severed 
by an atonal twanging of thread stretching to dangerous thinness. From high above, well out of sight, an unnerving call comes rolling down the sheer hilly face. Speak up! I can't hear you! I think the rope is breaking! Oh, I think he said the rope's breaking! And then the licorice safety line, in one sinewy snap, gives up the ghost. Never mind! Not for the first time today, I am the unwilling guinea pig in gravity's amnesiac-like compulsion for affirming the potency of her powers. Domino's shriek is unambiguous concurrence. The old girl still has it. Two stones whistling through a pipe. We are in free fall. The mystery of the depths below comes rushing up toward us at breakneck speed. And any attempts to slow the fall with one of the rapidly approaching trees results in friction-burned palms. As it happens, the gorge does indeed bottom out, which I gather only because it and my flank make fast friends, sending static shooting throughout my right side. Shock whites out all vision. At the foot of our implausibly survivable fall, I take a tally of my extremities. Legs and arms are all accounted for, and, as I note with a grateful exhalation, unshattered. I am taken briefly aback, however, when I discover two woolly forearms wrapped about my midsection with the protective force of a bench vice. Only after I've pried myself from their grasp does refreshing blood begin once more to freely circulate? I imagine I'd be in more than one piece had Domino not grabbed me mid-descent, and I'll need to thank him for that, once I've ruled out the possibility of brain trauma. Unfortunately, before I'm able to employ that one summer's worth of teen apocalypse training, scintillation of a sort my eyes have never before beheld seems to mesmerize my head into rotating, so that when I am able to take in the utterly indescribable splendor called, rather unceremoniously, the woods well, every light I have heretofore encountered appears a candle in comparison. Already, however, has radiance begun to fade from the shore. The hidden pool is bordered fruitfully in phosphorescent fungi and snails crawling at a glacial pace, both absorbed with far more sophisticated concerns than the foibles of man and wolfman, such as the latter's attempt to make a meal of the former. Being ignored by animal life feels rather like a blessing after the day I've had. Hoisting a fully wolfed-out domino alone would have been a feat on two pristine legs. On a twisted ankle, it's like painting the Sistine Chapel with an eyelash. Doable, but your wrists hold grudges forever. Carpals tunnel their insidious vengeance. Opposite us, fencing in the sparkling basin, an obelisk of a rock formation swells skyward terminating far beyond the light-prohibitive crown of green. The stone wall is alight with wavering ephemeral reflections, courtesy of the pool lapping at its feet. Perhaps borrowing a page from the bluish-white buildup forming where slate and water meet, my awe suddenly calcifies into panic. That brilliant palliative glow of lore is beginning to recede, and quickly, I stare on paralyzed as, from the outside of the sunken valley inward, a dome of darkness 
hurriedly encroaches. In the placid crystalline reflection, my face makes bare all the scratches earned from an evening of more intense than usual rollicking. I'll be wearing the black eye those tree branches gifted for at least a week. Rather than inspiring a bout of vanity, however, a resolution fierier than the barbecue pit in which I nearly died ignites in my spleen. I slap Domino, but like, in the face. Hey, it's an emergency. Domino's great head rocks forward, the eyes roving independently. He gives his skull a shake, and they swim back into cooperation. He registers the face after a moment. From his reclining position, the failing light of the well burns an aureole behind me. Domino gives a narcotic smile and asks, Bro, are you an angel? Nope, I reply. Nor a priest, though things are about to get very baptismal. I didn't bring my floaties. The combined effort of Domino, half lucid, and myself, half battered, is just enough to outpace our famished snail friend, still a half lifetime from his fungal gold. We're slowed further by the tug of water at clothing and fur. The well appears shallow at first beholding, a blue unfettered view to the supposed bottom, but an imprudent leg submerged too hastily and her true depth becomes clear. I'm a bit more consistent with what swimming technique my injuries will allow, but Domino beside me is a flailing teddy bear stuffed with marbles. Whenever surfacing is possible, a gulping of hurried lungfuls before Domino sinks us again, I retrain my eyes ahead, always paddling in the direction of the mystical oil spill. Several feet now lie between us and the pool's center. The light shrinks down to the size of a dinner plate. Frigid, sodden clothes cling to my skin, which has risen with goose pimples. A couple more strokes to go. That dinner plate becomes a tea saucer. Nearly there. A shoulder held fast in each hand, I dunk Domino backwards into the now ring-shaped circle of white light, and in doing so, elation floods me. Perhaps the universe, as it is wont to do, perceives my premature optimism as an affront to its grand design. A reed mocking the hurricane. Perhaps the universe just likes a good laugh. And who among us can fault at that? Offense or revelry? Punishment or mischief? When the rushing of the molested waters calms to a still, the outcome plays the same. There, the ring of light remains intact, no longer limbed with magic, but with the reflection, as I note when looking above, of a failing moon peeking through a window formed by two naked upper branches. Wholly besieged by the cool waters, a lunar impression floating above his forehead like some ephemeral tattoo. Domino has never looked more at peace. With a start, it occurs to me that he'd much prefer being a wherever wolf to a drowned wherever wolf, so, gripping his arms, I pull my waterlogged companion to a sitting position, watching rivulets of water roll from his coat. As the last of the liquid sloughs off into the pond, Domino blinks up at me. 
I don't know if what I'm reading in his eyes is a look of expectancy, but to stifle the burning building beneath my lids, I have to shield my own away. We... I didn't make it in time. I say after a minute. I'm sorry. <sighs> I figured. Domino says, a not imperceptible coloring of disappointment to his tone. Though, there's something else there, too. But I... I think that might be okay. What? R really? I chance a look his way. This may sound crazy, but I've never felt better. He clenches and unclenches his clawed fists. Stronger. Quicker. Smarterer. You did leave us squarely in your dust earlier. I know, right? Dude, did you see how long I held my breath just now? You're a regular werefish. Glub glub, brother. Still, I say, averting my gaze once more. I should have done more. You did everything you could, bro. As an ex-bandmate of mine used to say, Move your feet! Your boot spikes are fraying our cables! Which I took to mean, when life gives you a boot spike to the electrical wiring, you keep on shredding. Quite the loose interpretation, I mean, they probably just wanted you to stop ruining expensive equipment, but hey, they're not here to dispute it. Exactly! Besides, man, look! With this, he points toward the opening in the treetops, overlooking the woods well. The sun's coming up. And it is. Alighting in gradient strips of amber and rust that seem to blur the sky's perimeter. Hues of burgeoning daylight signal the promise of renewal. As more and more of night recedes beyond the horizon, so too does Domino revert to his comparatively hairless human form, claws retracting, snout caving in, skeleton performing its grotesque contortions in reverse. What say we get to drier land? Domino asks, shivers rattling his body. I remember suddenly that we've been sitting in chest-deep water and begin to stand. Right, right. I agree. Upon reaching the edge of the well, we collapse onto its banks and, once we've had our fill of gasping, wring out our soggy clothes. Danger a speck in the rearview mirror of our present calm, we stretch out upon the grass as though nothing can disrupt our reverie. Then, tearing through the morning, there comes a screaming from on high, a flurry of leaves as a figure crashes meteor-like to the grotto floor. It lies motionless for a worrying instant, and then flashes a thumbs up from its prone position. You good? the landlord mumbles through a mouth of vegetation. Domino and I share a glance that speaks to a brief lifetime of moments. Yeah, I reply. We're good. The landlord's bones, on the other hand, well, that's a story for a different time. You'll be happy to learn that Domino found something of a mentor in the Wolf of the Wood. They've got quite a lot in common, besides the whole lycanthropy thing, that is. If their first jam session taught me anything, it's that Domino really hasn't changed very much. And also, if the way the wolf fled is any indication, that it will probably be their final jam session. 
was it something I said? Are you coming back for rehearsal Tuesday? Ah, uh, but what am I telling you for? I'm sure you've met werewolves just like I have, in a town just like this one. It's all the same after all. Here, there, wherever. 